In the summer of 1968, it looked to many like America was on the verge of revolution. The Vietnam War was dragging on with images of death and destruction appearing on the nightly news and bodies being sent home by the thousands. This violence was stoking a counterculture that saw campus strikes, enormous protest actions, and even had some planning more radical means of resistance. In the midst of all of this, successive assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy had shook the nation to its core. All these factors came to a head in Chicago, the site of the 1968 Democratic National Convention. Protesters from across America descended on the city where they faced off against a violent police department while middle America bore witness on the evening news. As part of these protests, countercultural leader Abby Hoffman had tried to organize a free music festival. That festival was doomed from the beginning as the city refused to grant permits. Most of the musicians who were invited decided it was wise to stay away from the potential chaos, but one band showed up to perform. The Motor City Five. Guitarist Wayne Kramer remembered this show in a 2008 interview with Huffington Post. There was no stage, there was no flatbed truck, there was no sound system, there were no porta toilets, there was no electricity. We had to run an electrical cord from the hot dog stand to power our gear. And it was very tense. The Chicago police had been very aggressive and very intimidating all day. And even though it was a rock concert, and we were the only band to play, it didn't feel like a rock concert. There was a dark cloud over the day because we knew the likelihood of people being hurt was great. Within hours of that show, the scene had descended into riots, and by the next morning, 5,000 protesters were squaring off against police and the National Guards in an event that would live on as the battle for Michigan Avenue. If playing a show with jury-rigged equipment in the midst of a political protest doesn't embody the punk rock ethos, then I don't know what does. And MC5's legacy stretches far beyond that. At a moment when Sid Vicious was in grade school and the teenage Ramones were just picking up instruments for the first time, MC5 were already raging against the machine with the raw energy and political fury that would one day come to define punk rock. Like so many punks to come, MC5 burned fast and bright, flaming out before they could draw any real mainstream attention, but leaving a legacy like no other. Now, more than 50 years after they broke up, and long after many of the band members have died, the MC5 have a new album. Heavy Lifting, organized by Wayne Kramer and released earlier this year, is a swan song for those in the band who made it and a testament to the impact of those who passed. Let's take a closer look. The Motor City Five, as their name would suggest, were born in Detroit, a city with a rich history of both musical excellence and political defiance. In the mid-60s, Detroit, like much of America, was rife with a budding garage rock movement. The baby boom generation was coming of age, and many of them were buying cheap guitars and setting up in their parents' garages to make loud, raw, rock and roll music. But even from the early days, there was something different about the MC5. Their influences stretched beyond rock, with the group often listening to soul acts like James Brown, as well as wild, experimental jazz artists like Sun Ra and John Coltrane. Frontman Rob Tyner even took up his stage name in homage to McCoy Tyner, a pianist renowned for his work with Coltrane. This interest in jazz was thanks in part to the band's manager, the activist John Sinclair. Sinclair was a political radical and one of the founding members of the White Panther Party, an anti-racist group that fought for racial equality alongside the Black Panthers and the Rainbow Coalition. The need for this kind of political action became abundantly clear to the young MC5 during the long hot summer of 1967, a series of riots that broke out across America. The most violent of these took place in Detroit over five days in July. The Detroit riots saw 23 civilians killed and nearly 500 wounded. These events helped to further radicalize MC5, who started to appear on stage with rifles and even fake assassinations of Tyner at the end of the show. John Sinclair had a vision for music not just as entertainment, but as a radical tool on the front lines of protest. He called this vision the Guitar Army, and the MC5 were his first recruits. Part of the reason why the MC5 were able to tie themselves to such radical ideas was their unmatched live energy, which riled Detroit's teens into frenzy. 
One of those teens was Don Was, who would go on to have an illustrious career in the music industry, working with everyone from the Rolling Stones and Bob Dylan to Iggy Pop, Elton John, and Garth Brooks. I had a chance to speak with Was about his experiences with the MC5. I don't think any record really captured the energy that that band had, even the, their yeah. own records, even the live record. That's not what they sounded like. It was this monstrous sound, man. You could taste <laughs> the music that was coming out of the speakers. You, you could, you could see it. It was like a tsunami of, of energy and distortion and Motor City groove, an R and B groove underneath at the at the core. And their appeal went beyond the sonic. The messages in their lyrics connected with a generation of youths looking for purpose. Being a teenager, they were addressing th the theme of teenage angst, uh, but not in terms of my dad took the car keys away or my girls going to the prom with another guy. They had a keen understanding uh, uh, that was developed along with John Sinclair. And John coined the phrase guitar army with the understanding that a rock and roll band could be set their sights a little higher and aim at the purpose of, uh, well, in, in the 60s parlance, of creating a, a revolution that, that would in, instill a, a better system of government. <laughs> it, it didn't work, but it was, a no, it was actually a, a noble intention. The band channeled all of this countercultural energy into their live debut, Kick Out the Jams, an album which brims with all the rage and discord of its moment. That album saw the band openly embracing radical politics. It features a cover of Motor City is Burning, a song about the Detroit riots written by Al Smith and originally recorded by John Lee Hooker a year earlier. The album's opener, Ramblin' Rose, is a political sermon that calls its audiences to action, asking if they want to be part of the solution or part of the problem. But far and away, the most controversial track from their incendiary debut was Kick Out the Jams. That song was inspired by the band's tendency to heckle other performers at the Grand Ballroom, where they were the house band. When they decided another act was getting too indulgent or lacking in energy, they would yell, kick out the jams, in an attempt to rouse the audience or push the lackluster acts off stage. When they cut their live album, they opened the song with a raw shout of the now iconic line, kick out the jams, kick motherfuckers. This had their label, Electra, bristling. They were asked to censor the line in the final pressing of the album by replacing Motherfucker with Brothers and Sisters. The band capitulated for a radio edit, but refused to censor themselves for the album. As a result, the Detroit retailer Hudson's banned the album from their store. In response, the MC5 and John Sinclair doubled down, taking out a full-page ad in an underground newspaper that featured the lines, kick out the jams, motherfucker, and kick in the door if the store won't sell you the album. Fuck Hudson's. Well, this was an undeniably punk rock move, it was not the best career move for the band, as they prominently featured Electra's logo in their ad. This implied an endorsement that their label had very much not given. Hudson's pulled all of Electra's albums from their shelves in response, and the label dropped the MC5. Shortly thereafter, the band would part ways with John Sinclair, who would soon be arrested for marijuana possession and sentenced to 10 years in prison. Determined to focus on their music rather than political antics, the MC5 signed on with Atlantic Records and released two more albums. The first of these, the band's studio debut, was back in the USA. That album was produced by John Landau, who would go on to work extensively with Bruce Springsteen. Back in the USA was a little more contained than the manic energy of Kick Out the Jams, but it still stood as a radical political document. The most overt protest song on the album is The American Ruse, which sings about the hypocrisies of the American system that the 60s uprisings had revealed. Meanwhile, a song like Teenage Lust is full of youthful energy that easily predicts the music of Ramones, which was just around the corner. The MC5 had high hopes for Back in the USA, and while it's now seen as a stone-cold classic, it failed to perform. Their follow-up, High Time, did even worse and led to Atlantic dropping the band. By now, the political moment that birthed the MC5 had faded as well. 
the optimism of the 60s was ruthlessly crushed as the country entered the Nixon era. Any hopes of a free love revolution evaporated, and the band themselves were diminishing as well. Rifts formed as band members fell into addiction and despair, which ultimately led to their split in 1973. Wayne Kramer was incarcerated on drug charges, serving three years in jail, and the band would lose both Rob Tyner and guitarist Fred Sonic Smith to heart attacks in the early 90s. Over the years, there have been a handful of reunion performances with various iterations of the remaining members, but for the most part, the MC5 remained quiet. Then, in 2018, for the 50th anniversary of Kick Out the Jams, Wayne Kramer assembled an all-star lineup for the MC50 Tour, a celebration of the band that featured many of the artists who they helped influence, including members of Soundgarden, Faith No More, and Fugazi. The success of this tour must have put ideas in Kramer's head, because four years later, he gathered forces to bring the MC5 back for one more swan song. This new lineup would be produced by the legendary Bob Ezrin and feature a who's who of rock stars and industry stalwarts. Among them was Don Was. He told me that Kramer's vision for this project wasn't cashing in on nostalgia or remaking the original band, but rather capturing that fiery spirit that had been at the core of MC5's existence. No, none of us musicians who were on this date felt like that we were replacing the the original members of the MC5, and, and we all held that band uh, in in very lofty regard, you know. Uh, but what I think Wayne was concerned with was making sure that the ethos of the MC5 survived the members and and the and the original fans too. That that it kept going. That it was there was a valid point to the message behind the music and and to what they brought to music, the energy level. Was said that the recording sessions lived up to the energy that Kramer imagined. Everyone knew that we were stepping up the energy. Also, you know, Wayne was a lovely guy, man. He was a really good guy, and his vibe permeated the session. It was relaxed. It was old friends, and we could tell that we were getting something. We could tell as we were playing that every everything was connecting and that uh, there was this kinetic force field being uh, being built. With all the positivity and hope of the sessions, nobody expected tragedy to strike. On February 2nd, 2024, not long after the recording of the album was finished, Wayne Kramer died from pancreatic cancer. Just a few months later, original drummer Dennis Thompson, who also featured on Heavy Lifting, had a heart attack and passed at age 75. With his passing, no original members of the MC5 remained. Still, in the last months of his life, Kramer was able to pull together heavy lifting. The album features a parade of cameos that include Tom Morello, Slash, Vernon Reed, and more, but at the end of the day, it was driven by Kramer's vision, a continuance of that rebellious spirit. I, I, I think the important thing is that, uh, is that listeners understand that, that the fire inside does not have to diminish with age. You have to nurture it, and you have to create a lifestyle that allows you to keep the flame going. I, I think Wayne would want people to know that. that. I think that's why he made the record, to be honest with you. At the end of the day, Heavy Lifting stands as a powerful coda to the career of a truly unique band. The MC5 may have never reached the heights they could have, but they trailblazed like few others have. They embodied the spirit and the fight of the punk movement to come, helped lay the groundwork for heavy metal, and did what they could to stand up and build a better world. And their legacy stands as a message to the next generation of youth. In this politically divisive moment, where the future feels just as uncertain as it did in the 60s, heavy lifting is a call to pick up the mantle of the MC5 and to continue fighting the good fight, even when the odds feel stacked against you. What's imperative is that younger people pick up on this, the spirit of it and the energy of it and the rawness of it and the power of it and the honesty of it and the uh, optimism and altruistic motivation of it and find their own way to express it that, that reflects these times. That's, that's how you make it relevant. Don't try to be the MC5, but, but take that spirit and manifest it your own way. 
If you enjoyed this video and want to hear the rest of my conversation with Don Was, you can head on over to go.nebula.tv slash polyphonic, where you'll be able to watch that bonus content.